Dublin, 1911. Second city of the British Empire and destined to be the first city of the Irish Free State. At the time, the half a million population in the city was made up of a mixture of classes and divisions, all bound together in the life of the city. Rich and poor, immigrant and native, nationalist and unionist, live side by side. In July of 1911, King George V spent six days in Dublin. The royal party travelled to Dublin Castle from the harbour in Kingstown, better known today as Dunleary. Thousands lined the streets to eagerly watch his procession. We can be assured that his journey did not entail visiting the many slums and tenements, such as that of Mount Joy. Emigration had become a necessity for the many poor who could no longer bear to stay in a city which offered them so little. For the tens of thousands who lived in tenement slums, the brutal reality of daily life was left behind. The slums of Dublin were recognised as the worst in the United Kingdom. Dark, disease-ridden and on the fringes of society, largely ignored by those who prospered in other parts of the city. Dublin City was marked by a housing crisis that saw some 100,000 people living in tenement houses in the city. It is said that 80% of those living in the city tenements lived with their families in one room. Overcrowded tenements in Dublin were no longer confined to back streets. The city slums had taken hold of many of the Georgian houses, originally occupied by the wealthier middle classes who would move to the suburbs. With their several rooms and floors, these houses provided the ideal tenement building. Abercrombie put it that Dublin had some of the most architectural slums in Europe, and certainly the high ceilings of the Georgian valleys, that was an advantage. Uh, whereas you didn't get that in, in the hovels of the year. But the worst of all were the cellar dwellings, and there were still quite a number of these, although the, the corporation did try and get them closed down. So this was where people were literally living underground in the cellars and they were very dank, there, there was no ventilation and uh, like you can imagine for yourself how appalling conditions this would be. Georgian houses, which were once glamorous and fashionable Dublin, quickly turned to disease-ridden tenements, providing much needed accommodation for the lower classes. The city experienced some of the worst housing conditions anywhere in Europe, which meant that hygiene in the area was poor. Infectious diseases such as tuberculosis and measles afflicted the population. Hospitals such as the Rotunda were intended for those who lived in poverty and designed to improve the appallingly high levels of death in childbirth. As revealed by the 1911 census, a number of women lost children as a result of the social conditions that were prevalent, with 185 out of 1,000 babies born resulting in death. Authorities did their best under the circumstances, but the scale of the problem was too large, and as a result, there were accusations of corruption within Dublin Corporation. Dublin Corporation was pretty rotten and corrupt uh, when you consider what they could have done and what they didn't do. Um, it came, became quite clear from the 1914 housing inquiry, uh, for example, that one of the reasons Dublin Corporation may have been slow to remedy some of the terrible defects of tenement, tenement living was that 16 of them were actually owners of tenement buildings so they had a vested interest in the status quo remaining with regard to the conditions in which poor people were living. Free primary education offered access to a basic level of education with 75% of the Mountjoy population recording that they could both read and write. The reality on the other hand was that the poverty of the working class guaranteed that most of its children left full-time education before finishing national school. Children were forced to contribute to the upkeep of their families by selling or begging on the streets, leaving the poorest children with a patchy education. So the number one source of employment for, for Dublin workers would be general labouring, and they put themselves down, something like one in five on the census is down as a general labourer, and they use the word general because they're not building workers, they're not docked, they're whatever they happen to get. Uh, so that, that, is, that is the number one source, and the, thing, the, the major source 
thing you say about it is that it's casual work. You might have three days work one week, two days work the next, no work. So in, in, in other words, there, there's no security as to where they go to work, when they go to work, or whether they get to work. And there's no barriers to entry, the number of people looking for this is probably greater than the number of jobs available as well. Dublin in 1911 was a busy young city. However, the vast numbers of people migrating in from the impoverished countryside led to a huge competition for jobs, especially as those from the countryside were seen as more favourable workers. Census returns inform us of the situation of one Richard Hayes, who lived along with the seven others in his family in a one-room tenement on North Dock Street. He was listed on the return as a general labourer. It was the most common occupation for males at the time. The term general labourer was sometimes used by those who wished to avoid being labelled as unemployed. Census returns have uncovered that general labourers relied heavily on the nearby sawmill, corn mill and printing works for employment. The railway and docks close by provided employment for the tenement dwellers. In accordance with this, Hayes' stepson, John Daly, is listed as a railway porter. Interestingly, Daly's place of birth is noted as Tipperary. Many employers of the time were said to favour hiring those from outside of the city because tenement dwellers were viewed as bad workers. They were seen as being physically weak. It's difficult to say that religion kept people out of certain jobs or, or demanded that people would be in certain jobs. Like for example, the electrical trade, which was then developing in Dublin in 1911, electricians, electrical engineers, etc. That was almost exclusively Protestant. And you could look at those figures and say, well, Catholics were excluded. But of course, the reality was that not alone were these uh, people who worked as electricians or electrical engineers Protestant, but they were also England, English. Uh, or Scottish, and the fact was that these were immigrants who had come in because the skills skills were not within the Irish workforce, and the fact that they were Protestant was almost inc incidental. It's not like there was a bar on religion in it, so it's very difficult and very dangerous to make general uh, general generalizations about certain classes or, or certain religion. Or, sorry, about certain religions being excluded from uh, certain positions. Women tried to make money as dealers, selling flowers, fish, or old clothes on the side of the streets like that of Mary McCarthy at Gloucester Place. For some women, escaping poverty meant turning to prostitution on the streets or in brothels. The only valid records of prostitutes were of those in the census forms filled out by Mountjoy Prison. One of the poorest areas in the city was close to Mountjoy Square and was infamously known as the Monto after Montgomery Street. Up to 1,600 prostitutes worked at any one time with all classes of customers catered for. If you take that Dublin at the end of the 19th century was still a garrison city, a very substantial uh, system of barracks in the city uh, with a very large uh, population of soldiery, it's also a significant port and you have very difficult economic circumstances for a large proportion of the population. It's reasonable in those circumstances to understand how a large red light district would emerge for many of the women involved, it was the only economic opportunity that was there, and you have a ready clientele in terms of the soldiers and the sailors of the port. A Magdalene Asylum located on Lower Gloucester Street aimed to rehabilitate these fallen women. However, the reality was quite different, and word of the mistreatment and suffering endured here became widespread, often compared to a local prison. Very little information was given on the women in these institutions, listing only their surnames and ages in the census forms, as they were not seen worthy of owning an identity. On Census Day in 1911, there were 159 women living in this convent, ranging from 18 to 95 years of age. The occupations noted as launderers and occupational therapists were a far cry from the truth. I suppose the biggest thing that probably surprises people is when you go to the admissions registers, which we have done at great length, and we have over 4,000 
entries at least for Sean McDermott Street, I think, over that. And um, about 95% of the women were in and out, in and out, in and out. There was a constant, um, you know, using it for respite care, using it when the winter was cold, when the weather was bad, um, using it to get well. Probably its most positive feature was its infirmary. It had a very good infirmary. And I think that was a big attraction um, in terms of getting medical care and also people coming in to die. A number of women felt the need to boycott the 1911 census and risked prosecution and protest for women's right to vote. Although the numbers who succeeded in evading enumeration was very small, the suffragettes succeeded in drawing a good deal of attention to the cause. From the 1911 census, it appears that this embargo took place only in middle class areas. Yet, it marked a further stage on the road towards full scale militant activity in Dublin. With civil unrest on the horizon, thoughts turned to the formation of a new republic, a new nation. Dublin was moving into a decade of remarkable transformation. Little in the city was to remain untouched. First, the 1913 lockout would redefine the nature of commerce and class relations in the city. This was to be followed by the 1916 rising, the War of Independence, and the ensuing Civil War, which would turn politics and government on its head. At the time of the 1911 census, Ireland and indeed Dublin was on the verge of revolt.